Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening, and welcome to our second edition of Guess Who, the Ohio State University STEM game show brought to you by the STEM Impact Collaborative. I'm Wayne Schlingman, and I'll be serving as your host this evening. We have a few short announcements to share before the program starts to ensure that all attendees have the best experience possible. We are happy to be able to provide captioning for this event. In order to not interfere with the captioning, we have turned off the chat. Instead, we will be using the Q&A feature to communicate throughout the program. We want you to participate, including completing polls, posting questions, up upvoting questions. The polls will appear on the screen when live, but the Q&A function at the bottom of your window will always be active. If you have any technical questions, use the Q&A button and a member of our team will swoop in and help you out. You are providing your own beverages, bites, and bathrooms this evening, so hopefully you remember where you placed them. Before we begin, as part of The Ohio State University, we acknowledge the land on which campus sits has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples, specifically the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, and Delaware nations. We honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which we gather. Now for our game show. Guess Who is a fast paced game where two guessers will work to solve a number of challenges from our three researchers. You two can play along at home and help nudge our guessers in the right direction. There will be three rounds of competition this evening followed by a question and answer session. So let me now introduce our two guessers and allow them to tell you a little about themselves. First, we have Catherine Kelly. Catherine, would you please briefly introduce yourself to the audience? Hello everybody, Catherine Kelly. I'm executive director of the Ohio Manufacturing Institute here at the Ohio State University. And I can honestly say I know nothing. Excellent. Second, we have Johnny DiLoretto. Johnny, would you please also introduce yourself? You're muted. No worries. Here we go. I'm Johnny DiLoretto. I am uh, the Director of Community Relations at WCBE and longtime film critic in Columbus, uh, media personality, performer, whatever you need. So here I am, I'm ready to play. Excellent. Well, thank you both for being here. Our guessers are competing for bragging rights. No more and no less. To make this game work, we searched deep into the heart of the Ohio State University to find a range of researchers who were willing to play along. Now I invite our three contestants to join us on screen. But making small talk is important. So let's start things off by asking each of our contestants to describe the most exciting thing they have done in the last six months. So Emily, will you please describe, will, or will you please describe something exciting in the last six months? Oh, hello. Um, in the last six months, I was really thrilled to complete a photo book for my brother. So it was a family project uh, for his uh, important birthday. So that was uh, the most exciting uh, achievement and uh, it was fun to do it. Excellent. Next up, we'll have Nick. This is kind of a difficult question to answer, uh, sort of given the last year. Um, I guess given that, I think the most exciting thing I've done in the last six months was see a movie in theaters. I, I, big change over the last year. <laughs> I like it. And last but not least, our other Emily. I would say the most exciting thing I've done in the last six months is get to go hiking in Colorado and really explore and get outside of my apartment where I have been stuck for the last year and a half. All right. To make it more interesting, we will play our three rounds this evening. These rounds will be different than our inaugural event that we had in the spring. So round one is called One Truth and Two Lies. Round two will be What Does It Cost? And round three is called draw it. We will explain each round, how each round works before it starts. All right, so let's start with round one. 
we have one truth and two lies. So the contestant working in this area will need to answer, answer honestly, and the others can lie. We will alternate back and forth between our guessers, asking questions that all the contestants need to answer. At home, feel free to suggest some questions for the guessers um, to ask using the Q&A function. Our topics tonight are ice, stars, and mathematics or numbers. So we'll start with topic one, ice. Question one goes to Catherine. I would like to ask, um, so what is your favorite ice formation? All right, and our first contestant to answer will be Nick. That's a really good question. Um, my favorite ice formation is the Kolka Glacier, it's like located kind of on the border of Russia and Georgia. All right, our next contestant to answer will be Emily. So my favorite ice formation is uh, frost flowers that forms uh, on sea ice, young sea ice. It has the shape of a flower, but it's frost. <laughs> All right, and our next contestant, Emily. My favorite ice formation are, um, it is the glacier that's in Montana, like by, by the um, border with Canada. Excellent. All right, question number two for this topic, ice goes to Johnny. Wow, okay, ice, let's see. So about 50 million years ago, alligators, lived in the Arctic. Um, and we know that polar bears don't live in the Antarctic. So how did alligators get out of there? And how did polar bears never make it to the Antarctic? All right, and we'll go back same order of Nick. Will you give us your answer first? I guess I'm not, I'm not really sure how to answer this one. I guess this is, I would say this is more for, a, it's out of my specialties. This is more for like a biologist studying the evolution of animals. So <laughs> unfortunately I can't give more details than that. All right, next up is Emily. Yeah, I kind of would say the same. It's for biologists, I would. I would think also maybe for geologists who would study the uh, continental drift. So considering the continents probably were not in the same position 15 million years ago, maybe that's part of an explanation there. That's what I can say. All right, and Emily. Uh, you know, 15 million years is a, a really long time, and the global climate has changed drastically in different regions of the Earth over that period of time. So, you know, the climate changed, so different species are best suited to live in different areas. All righty. So now we can move on to topic number two, stars. So we will have a different order of our contestants. I will call you out one by one again. But we will start with our question from Johnny. Okay, stars. Let's see. Um, so, can is this? It has to specifically be star related, or any sort of astrophysics question or astronomy question? I suppose you could answer any question that comes to your mind. Okay. So recently, I read about astromycology, uh, which is um, using mushrooms to terraform other planets. And I was wondering how that would actually work. All right, and we'll start with contestant Emily. Is that me, this yes. Emily? Yes. <laughs> um, I am not sure. I am guessing that, you know, planets like Mars are not currently inhabited and don't have any life on them. And mushrooms can live in a variety of different locations and harsh conditions. So they might be the best species to try to start growing something on a planet like Mars. All right, next contestant is Nick. What do you think? 
yeah, I guess this is another question I don't know how to how to answer. I, I would say this is more for like a like a biologist, but I guess it's sort of a problem of you know getting enough oxygen or enough um, sort of just ox oxygen into the atmosphere to really start you know having life explode there because it's just a it's a problem like that. All right, and Emily. Um, I think, uh, yeah, mushrooms could develop on a rock planet, like a telluric planet, as it might need a substrate to thrive. So what was the, <laughs> the bottom line, the question, actually? The... Just like how, how that would work, how mushrooms could terraform a different planet so that we might be able to live on it. I would think it could work on, on, on a telluric planet that is not too acidic. Alrighty, I love how this question would be perfect for one of our um, contestants that was on the first version of Guess Who, who studies mycology, I love it. All right. So for our next question on the topic of stars, Catherine, what would you ask our um, contestants? I would ask um, how much space debris falls into the Earth's atmosphere every year? Great question. All right, let's start with Emily again. Most things are don't fall into the atmosphere because they're programmed to stay in orbit around the Earth. That's why our cell phones keep working. Um, but what does gets burned up as it is falling down? So we don't have satellites in our backyards. All right, Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I guess you have the you know occasional um, sort of as like asteroids, small little small little asteroids coming in. Um, but again, most of those start burning up. You know, so maybe very small pebbles reach, but typically they're they're gone by the time they can touch ground. Ooh, these are great answers. And last is Emily. Yeah, there most of the material burns in, in the atmosphere, and uh, the biggest one uh, can reach the surface. Uh, and but th there are many micro meteorites. Uh, reaching the surface of, of the earth and all that together represent a lot of mass, but it's hard to quantify. Oh, I like it. These answers are great. So let's move on to topic number three, which happens to be numbers. So to begin, we will have Catherine pose a question and we will move on to our contestants. I was wondering, you know, who do you think is the, which mathematician has contributed the most to, to the field? I mean, who do you think has made the biggest impact historically? All righty, and the first contestant to answer will be Emily. Oh, it's uh, hard to choose. Uh, uh, there's been so many great contributions. Uh, I would pick a French. I would pick uh, Joseph Fourier for the, the Fourier transform, which is very useful in many applications. Oh, I love it. Next up is Emily. Um, I would say Raymond because um, there's a lot of of current research that's still happening on the theorems that he proposed um, and people are still trying to prove it. So it's interesting because it's still ongoing. All righty, and Nick. Yeah, um, I would say this is gonna be like a contemporary answer. Um, Terry Tao, uh, he's a professor at UCLA and he does a lot of, um, he, his research reaches I think a broader audience. He's one of those um, people that you can catch on some talk shows. So he has that personality, which is you know, good for a study. All right, excellent. Johnny, what is your question for numbers? So as a, a movie guy and uh, Nick, I was happy to hear that you, you recently had a theatrical going movie experience. That's great. My question is, 
what is your favorite movie featuring someone who's a mathematician or just a movie that gets math right? What is your favorite math movie and why? All right, great question. So we'll start with the same order. Emily, favorite movie that gets math right? Uh, Will Hunting. All right, good Will Hunting. Next, Emily. Hidden Figures. Hidden Figures, excellent. And Nick. And Who Knew Infinity. What was that? The Man Who Knew Infinity. Cool. I like it. I like it. And we have a bonus round for numbers. What is your favorite mathematical equation? And we will start with Emily. I got to say the quadratic formula. All right, Nick. Um, this one is, I guess, x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. This is for Ma's last theorem. Ooh, I like it. And Emily. It's just a simple linear equation. Y equals AX plus B. Ooh, Use it every day. All right, so our contestants have not made it easy. So while you've been dreaming up some wild ideas at home, let's see if we can match our researchers to their topics. So we will do three polls, multiple choice questions to match everyone. But we will start with, who do you think studies ice? Is it Emily? Is it Nick? Or is it Emily? And I can do some noise, do, 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 do. So wait, we vote on this, right? So yes, you guys are going to, the, the audience is trying to help you figure it out. So we're looking at the poll live right now. Okay, so just the audience is doing this. Yes, because we're going to ask you who you think right Got after this. Got it. The audience is helping you out. Mm -hmm. All right, and our poll result is split. We oh. think that there is equal numbers of people voting for both Nick and Emily studying ICE. Hmm. <laughs> so I don't know if there's that much help there, but we'll keep that in mind as we wow. move forward. Now, who do you think studies star? Again, is it Emily, Nick, or Emily? Ooh, looks like we are split on this one too with a slight lead given to Emily, but almost even between each of our three contestants in studying stars. So again, I don't know if our audience is going to be much help on this one. And with our last question, who do you think studies numbers? We have people stumped. Again, we're pretty even with a slight lead to Emily on numbers. So guessers, we're gonna start with you and we would like you to take 30 seconds, think about who do you think does what research? And then we will start with Johnny. Who do you think studies each research topic, ice, numbers and stars and why? Oh, gee, why? Okay, let me see here. I think, I think that Nick is the numbers guy. And I think that because of his, uh, well, his movie answer, it's very different. I think a lot of people might figure that Goodwill Hunting, uh, you know, might have like a, a you know, who just go to the math. Um, answer on that. So I like his answer on that. And I like some of his other sort of his mathematician answer too. So I think Nick is the numbers guy. Um, I what do you think is our stars? Yeah, stars. I think it's, uh, I think Emily is, is the star person. 
and I, I, I liked her answer about the mushrooms. And uh, she said something about acidity and the substrate. And because I'm an idiot, those sounded really uh, brilliant to me. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I liked her, um, her, her answer about the, uh, you know, the, the star mass drifting down to Earth. So I believe Emily is our astronomer. All right. And that would leave Emily as ice. And what triggered you on Emily and ice? Uh, I, I just, you know, I, I, I know that my, my question about alligators was kind of, uh, unwieldy, but she sort of reined it in and made a, you know, made a coherent sort of response out of that. So. Excellent. I like your thinking. Cool. Cool. All right, Catherine, what do you think? I, I think I'm with the audience. This is a really tough one. Um, so, um, I'm going to start with the numbers right. and, I actually think that Emily is the numbers scholar. Um, just she came right off at the bat with the response on what uh, you know what is the uh, you know favorite mathematical equation. So um, so based on that, I, I I thought just so much confidence in that answer. So I that's that's why I'm going to attribute her to um, as a mathematician um, for the stars. I actually thought that was Nick. Um, I'm not sure why I think it's Nick, other than <laughs> um, I, I thought he was a little less certain on the um, the earth science questions. And so uh, do I have some help from the audience? No, okay. I was, I was hoping I might get a last minute you know, response from the audience. So, um, so I think, the climate scientist is Amalie, so I, I think the um, just the grasp of topology and um, you know and and just the, the notes I was taking, it seemed as if she had a little bit more information in that category. So and uh, so I'm going to stick with that. So um, Emily as the mathematician, Nick is the astronomer and Amelie as the climate scientist. All right. So we will start. So we have, um, here are researchers. We have Emily G. We have Nick G and Emily B. We will start with um, Emily B. Would you please describe what you study? There's a hint on the screen, but let's go ahead and tell us what you do. Okay, I do study ice. <laughs> uh, so in particular, uh, well, glaciers, like natural ice. And um, in particular, I'm uh, looking at ice cores. So cylinders, vertical cylinders that we take from glaciers because uh, every layer of a glacier, every layer of ice um, is a snapshot of the atmosphere. Uh, at the time, this uh, layer of snow fell on the surface of the glacier. So thanks to, to an ice core, we have uh, several snapshots of the past atmosphere and uh, an idea of what was the climate of the past and also the environment in, in the past. Awesome, thank you very much. All right, next we have Nick who studies numbers. Would you please take a minute and also tell you, tell us what you do. Yeah, so uh, I'm called a number theorist um, and we, I spend most of my time um, studying numbers. So there's a lot of things that numbers, you can study about numbers and in particular, uh, problems that I find most interesting deal with prime numbers. Um, so these are the numbers only divisible by itself and one. Um, so like two and three and five and seven. Um, and so my work um, in particular works on, it's like a little branch of this really famous longstanding problem called the Riemann hypothesis. Um, and most of my time is spent sort of researching connections to that and just looking at numbers all day. Excellent. 
And Emily, will you please talk a little bit about you, what you do with STARS? So I am an astronomer. Um, I spend most of my time studying the origin of the elements. So all the things that are on your periodic table in your chemistry class, all of that was made through the STARS over the course of their life or when they die and explode, they create all of that material. So we can look at the stars in our galaxy today and see how much oxygen, iron, magnesium they have in them um, and learn about the past of our galaxy. Excellent. So those are our three contestants. They definitely fooled our guessers. <laughs> they gave some excellent, excellent answers though. They were so let's very go tricky. Ahead. Yes, they were. All right, so let's take a short break. So anybody that needs to refill a beverage or take a quick bathroom break, we will be back in less than two minutes. So if you need to do that, go get yourself situated and we will start ourselves with round two. What does it cost? And we will need audience participation. We can do a speed round of questions. All right, as we, as everybody is coming back, I can start to explain a little bit about round two. So round two is called, what does it cost? So that means everybody's gonna have to put their thinking caps on, think about what it is we're looking at, which may not be explained. And then how much do you think it costs to make that item or purchase that item? So each researcher is going to share one piece of equipment that they use in their research. So it's just one small piece that they do. And then after we see that description, everyone's going to have a moment to vote on what they think it actually costs. And then our guessers will see the results before they have to make their final decision for points. And as a reminder, those of you that are voting at home are also in it to win it. There are prizes if you're playing along with polls. So we will have some swag from some of our departments in the STEM Impact Collaborative and we can send those along. So make sure that you are participating. All right, so let's start round two. And our first object is from the topic stars. So Emily G, will you tell us a little bit about what you use a fiber positioner plate for? Sure. So a fiber position or plate um, goes into a telescope. Um, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but there are a bunch of tiny little holes drilled into this plate. And each of those holes lines up to a star on our sky. Um, and we put fiber optic cables into each hole, and then we can get the light from that star into the telescope. Alrighty. So how much does it cost? It's poll time. So is it free? Is it less than $20? Is it 20 to $100? Is it 101 to $500? 500 to $2,000? 2000 to $10,000? 10 to $20,000 or more than $20,000? Vote now. All righty, let's see what our results are. We have about 32%, one third of our audience thinks it's between 500 and $2,000. And then the majority of people beyond that are sort of evenly split between 2,000 and more than $20,000. So they think this plate is rather expensive. Guessers, what do you think? Johnny, how much do you think it costs? I'm going with the audience. I think it's uh, between 501 and $2,000. 
All right. And Catherine, what do you think? I feel like I'm on the prices right. Uh, <laughs> I can I, get a big wheel. Yeah, I think this is surprisingly reasonably priced. So I'm I'm actually going to go with the minority and go with the less than five hundred dollars. All right, we have over five hundred dollars and under five hundred dollars, and the answer is Emily. How much does a fiber positioner plate cost? It costs about four hundred dollars. Woo woo! <laughs> So anybody that guessed between $101 and $500 gets a point, and so does Catherine. Excellent. All right, what is our next object? We have numbers. So Nick, can you tell us a little bit about what you use this chalk for? So I guess mathematicians, um, <clears throat> we have a fascination with using chalk to write on blackboards. So I guess if you... If you've seen Goodwill Hunting, sort of that equation on the blackboard is something that still exists in every math department. Um, sort of, we have very strong opinions um, about preferring chalk over um, over like Expo markers, and in particular, this chalk here. You can think of this as the the roll like the Rolls Royce of chalk. It's the fanciest chalk in the world. Um, this is now manufactured in Korea, but was originally manufactured in uh, Japan. Um, and this is called Hagaramo chalk. So just, this, this is the you know, fancy writing tool we use every day to lecture and talk about math. All righty. So audience, now is your time to vote. It is time to figure out how much this chalk costs. So for a box of chalk, All right, we have our answers coming in. We'll get our music playing. All right, so we have our poll ended and it's time to release our numbers and see if it will help out our audience. So we have one person who says it's less than 20 for a box of chocolate, uh, for a box of chocolate, a box of chalk. Okay, <laughs> we, can, we know that it's past eight o'clock on, on Wednesday. All right, our next group, 63% of our audience says it's between 20 and $100. And 26% of our audience says it's between 100 and $500. Now remember, this is the Rolls Royce of chalk. I can only imagine how it writes on a board. Catherine, what do you think it costs? So for a box, I would actually, if it's the Rolls Royce of chalk, I'm going to have to go with the audience and say it's between $20 and $100. All right. So we have a vote for $20 and $100. Johnny, what do you think? Just to make this interesting and to stay in keeping with my um, getting most of this wrong, uh, I'm going to say it's over $100. I'm saying 100 to, 101 to 500 all right, all right. So let's bring up Nick. And Nick, how much does a box of chalk cost? So before they started making it in Korea, the Japanese one would cost about over a hundred. But now, since they're making it in Korea, a box of a uh, box of chalk, mostly chocolate, is about thirty to forty dollars, depending on what you want. <laughs> So you're a couple you're a couple years late, Johnny. Oh man. <laughs> I think we both should get that right. Yeah, let's both get it right, Catherine. All yeah. right. So with our point counters, they both get a win. I love it. <laughs> I can only imagine what this writes like, but then you have to be picky on what kind of board you write on too, right? Yeah, you have to write on the Rolls Royce of chalkboards as oh, well. Yeah. All right. And then our last piece of equipment, we have a Coulter counter. Emily B, would you please tell us what you use a Coulter counter for? Yeah, a Coulter counter, we use it to count uh, particles in, in ice. So when we get ice in uh, small ice cubes and we melt them, uh, we put them in the Coulter counter and you have a probe uh, and you have the liquid going, going through the probe and you have an idea of how many particles you have in your ice cubes. 
and uh, how big they are. So we, we get the diameter also. So uh, with that, uh, we reconstruct a uh, record of uh, dust concentration, atmospheric dust concentration in our ice core. All righty, so poll time. It is time to figure out what a Coulter counter costs. Our audience definitely thinks these are a little bit more expensive. So let's go ahead and release the poll. We have one person that thinks it's between $100 and $500. We have five people that think it's between $500 and $2,000. Another five between $2,000 and $10,000. Four that thinks it's ten dollars to $20,000. And only a few that think it's more than $20,000. All right, Johnny, what do you think it costs? Hmm. Well, I mean, it depends on if you're getting the Honda of Coulter counters or the Tesla of Coulter counters. But I'm going to say it's got to be expensive. I'm going with uh, 2000 to 10000 All right. So we have a vote for 2000 to $10,000 for a Coulter counter. And Catherine, what do you think? I'm thinking that... It, I, you know, since I don't know if this can be used for other purposes, other scientific purposes, and how many of them are out there, supply and demand, all that great stuff, um, I'm I'm actually going to go less. I'm going to go five hundred and one to two thousand dollars. All right, Emily, how much does it cost? It is quite expensive, and uh, you can get a. Uh, a new one these days for more than forty thousand dollars. So this kind of equipment, I think, it's used also to to count blood cells and uh, like in in the medical uh, uh, field uh, of research. So yeah, it's it's really fragile the probe that that is mounted in it. So I think that's the expensive part and the detector. So All very, right. Very precious. So our guessers got it wrong. As we move on to round three, I want a couple lightning questions. Emily, what is the craziest thing that you stuck in your culture counter to measure? Did you ever stick like your soda ice in there? That would be an expensive uh, test <laughs> if I would end up uh, clogging the probe and, uh, with my soda. Um, no, I, I never dare to, to put anything else than, than ice in there. Ice. <laughs> yes. Nick, what is the craziest place that you've had to use chalk? Craziest place I've had to use chalk? The Rolls Royce I, of chalk. The Rolls Royce of chalk, yeah. Um, so some universities have chalkboards outside. And so I guess I've, I've written there. I guess that's the most interesting answer I can give. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Oh, if you has a few of those, we expect some drawings soon. <laughs> and Emily, what is the craziest place that you have seen a fiber plate? They are all over OSU Astronomy Department. Um, there are some that have been turned into tables in the PRB, and my advisor has one that has been turned into a clock in her office. Also, if there are educators on the call, you can get a fiber plate for your own classroom if you would like to see one in person. Excellent, excellent. Those are just great stories to have. All righty, we are on to round three. It is called Draw It. This is where Pictionary meets Wheel of Fortune. Mm -hmm. So now it's all on the contestants and their terrible drawing skills because of Zoom. I love it. So each contestant, will be given a unique research phrase and they will have two minutes to draw it using the annotate feature on Zoom. So in real time, our guessers will compete and the audience may help, um, but you will compete to guess the phrase of, of words that, or, or the words that make up the phrase. Um, so just so that everybody knows, this is a goofy phrase that is one of our takes on a person's field. So it's not directly related, but it's all related. So it's kind of fun. All right. So first up we have, and I have to figure out where we are. We have Nick. 
So we'll be giving Nick the phrase, and then as you guess the right words, we will put them onto the slide. We're supposed to guess, right? Wayne? Yes, so you and okay. Catherine can just live guess with each other. Okay. Shoot out answers. Let's do it. So we have blank, blank, into blank. And you get a point for each one of the words guessed. Okay. All right, and time starts now. Oval. Donut. Excellent. Goes. Arrow. Ow. Coffee. Donuts dunked into coffee. Wow. You're close. Donuts dipped into coffee. This is donuts goes into coffee. Donuts into. Uh. Donut hole. What is that? Lots of arrows, Nick. So the arrows. <laughs> coffee. Not coffee. Monica says not coffee. No. Oh, we have donuts twist into cup as a guest from the audience. Don't what what was it? Donuts <laughs> twist into cup. Also donuts very close. Cup. Donuts. Uh, into my donuts. Ooh, I heard the word. Did what? Cup mug. Mug. Excellent. Okay. Donuts dipped into mug. Dunked into mug. Donuts. What is that second word? Where is that? Nick, give us a second one. Ten seconds left. Twist. Donuts dropped into mug. Dropped. Fall. Twist is close, and our last word is. Yeah. Turn. Uh, turn. Donuts turn into mugs. What? So the idea that they're the same shape in math. Oh. <sighs> Bizarre. Great guessing, though. Great guessing by our audience and our guessers. All right, we're going to clear all the drawings. And let's go ahead and start next with Emily. So Emily B. And we're going to be sending the phrase now, but it'll be three words that are related to Emily's work. Three different words. Three different words. OK. Emily, are you ready to, to draw or are you going to use the paper? I'm going to use the paper. All right. So we can go ahead and we'll, we'll be watching you and you'll have to hold it up about every 10, 15 seconds so we can see and guess. All right, so let's start our time. We have two minutes. Feel free to just start guessing words if you would like. I guess ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Substrate. No. <laughs> All right, Emily, will you go ahead and hold up your paper so we can see it and say something? We'll have okay. to pin her up. I can't see. I can't see her. Hold on, I'm going to, there we go. Hold on. There we go, we're spotlighting oh. her. All right. What is our guess? Uh, Drill four. What pinnacle. was that? Did I say it again? Pinnacle. Four. So I hear pinnacle. 
I said core. Um, oh, core. particles. Flakes. Uh, Crystals. Ooh. Yeah, I said drill. All right. Drill is one of the words. Drill. Oh. All right, we have two more. All right, yes, we have two more. So drill, drilling is the first word. I will give a hint. Remember what she studies. Yep. Rake. Rake. Uh, brush, comb, curling. <laughs> All right, we have suggestions from the audience. We have ice core particles and drilling ice cores. They're close. They're good ideas, but not the words we're looking for. It's like a cup there. Um, drilling. Snowballs. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, I like it. We have a guess of drilling for diamonds. Ooh. And drilling glacier cores. It is glaciers. That is one of our words, Isaiah. All right. Web, spider, spider web. So uh, what's our middle word? Thread, web. Drilling. Uh, Silk. Ooh, I like that. Web. Actually, I don't know what it would have to do with drilling and glaciers, but there is a spider web up there. Yeah, field. Um, uh, I don't think of spooky and ice. Uh, All right, 15 seconds left. We'll, we'll count down. Not run off. Um, what do we got? Drilling into glacier. Uh, you need the whole phrase. All right. Drilling, so our time is up, and we were looking for glaciers. drilling dusty glaciers oh so the dust particles so the dirt we were looking for the dirt good guessing good guessing an excellent drawing and great guessing from our audience all right so let's move on to our third contestant let's remove the spotlight all right so now we have blank blank in a blank and emily g will be drawing so remember, this is astro related. Okay. All right, let's go. Uh. Oh. Oven? A bowl. Bowl, microwave. Envelope. Star. Stars. Constellation. Right, the stars is the second word. Good guess. Okay. Baking. Envelope. Stars. Bowl. Star. No. Um, okay. Cooking. And a smile. All right, our audience says and baby. cooking and baking. Baby. Babies, twins, going uh, in a crib and a bassinet in a house, in a home. You're on the right track. In a family. Oh, in a basement, in a, in a nursery. <laughs> What'd you say? In a nursery. All right, that's the last word. We just need the first one. A uh, bowl, bowl of stars in a nursery, or um, envelope of stars in a nursery. Bowl envelope. Pacifier, Passy. Oh, that's a dude. <laughs> <laughs> and time is up.
Oh, man. Wow. So our audience had given you the right word. We were looking for cooking stars in a nursery. Oh. So this is a person stirring a bowl next to the oven. Oh, that's an oven. Here, I thought it was a microwave. Yeah, I thought it was a microwave or it could have been a... <laughs> well, you can cook in a microwave too. You could. Oh. I love it. So what are our scores for this round? We need to get our tally up for both Johnny and Catherine. We had some excellent drawing and we have Johnny with six points. Oh. And we have Catherine with four points. That last round save you. Oh my God, it did. And you Catherine, get all I, of the bragging rights. I don't want any bragging rights. I thought we were gonna work together as a team to figure <laughs> out the truth. You did work together as a team. I loved it. Yeah, it was fun. That was awesome. Yeah, and we did got, figure out the truth. Yes, we got to the truth. We did. And now we have a bunch of things that we need to experience. We need to go exp see see the Coulter counter in action. We need to see some of these plates by coming to Ohio State. We'll check them out. And we need to write with the Rolls Royce of, of chalk. Absolutely. Sounds like right. a loop to me. So as we move on to our q and A, I I would like to thank our guessers and ask them to turn off their cameras as they take a break. And we will open the floor for a few questions to ask our contestants. So if you have a burning question, please go ahead and drop it in the Q&A box. But we'll start out by asking each of our researchers, our three graduate students, to share their most exciting day as a researcher. So let's go ahead and let's just start with Emily G. Um, well, I spend most of my time on the computer, even though many astronomers you would think are at the telescopes. So I've got to say the most exciting days are when you actually get to go see the telescopes. Um, and so I have been to one of the telescopes in Arizona that OSU has time on. And it's this, you know, machine bigger than my house that moves so smoothly. So it's very cool to see and stand next to. All right, Emily. Oh, the most exciting day, uh, I mean, there are many, whenever you go to the field on a glacier, I, I would say in the high Arctic on the Vesfona ice cap, when it was uh, uh, suddenly cleared from the blizzard and uh, you, you've been working for 48 hours nonstop uh, and you're so tired and that you had uh, hallucinations and and you would see trees on an ice cap because you're so tired and there is no vertical shape uh, on a glacier. Uh, and then suddenly weather clears up and, and you see that you are on an island and the Arctic Ocean in, in front of you. And you've done a lot of work, so that's exciting and, uh, and the world is yours. All right, and Nick. I guess my most exciting days are when I'm at a at a conference, um, I guess that's when I get to see sort of all my math friends from around the uh, or just around the world, um, and we just get to stay up late. Um, you know, I guess start seeing things and the things that we write and talk about math for sometimes a weekend, sometimes a whole week. So <laughs> sounds excellent. All right, we do have a couple of questions from our audience. Um, First one, um, or ones are towards Emily, or Emily. Um, what made you interested in researching ice and what is the oldest ice that you have seen or worked with? Uh, I got into uh, ice core uh, paleoclimatology uh, because first I wanted to be uh, uh, studying Mars <laughs> and um, even going there. And I was thinking, okay, what could I, study to be sent there and I discovered there were ice caps on Mars. So, okay, why not ice? So that got me into the uh, glaciology field. And the oldest ice I had the privilege to handle is um, a piece from the Guli ice cap located in Tibet, which is uh, half a million years old. So to handle with care. Wow. All right, Nick. I'll ask you this one. 
What is the most unusual or unexpected collaboration you've been a part of? So like collaborations outside of your immediate field potentially. Okay, so I, it's actually my current collaboration right now. Um, in math, there's like lots of these different subfields. Um, and a lot of the time they kind of have two branches. Um, one's called al algebra, at least this is theoretical math. One's called algebra, one's called um, analysis. I Most of my work is in analysis. So, you know, doing heavy duty calculus is the best way to put it. Um, and one project I'm working on right now is um, I guess one of one of my collaborators does only algebra things and very abstract and very weird algebra things I can barely understand. But there's a really cool connection to number theory. So I'm serving as kind of the, the number theory expert on the project, even though I know very little about the, the abstract things he's doing. <laughs> All right, and Emily, we'll do one question with you and all of the rest of the questions that people have submitted or are submitting towards the end, we will give to our researchers and they will answer them and we will send them out to everybody. So we will still answer all of your questions, but as we are running out of time, Emily, is there one urgent message or takeaway that um, you'd like to share about your research or work with the general public? So this is not my research, but since we had a question about terraforming using mushrooms, um, I think that you know visiting other planets and potentially making those planets habitable is something that people are really excited about. The general population is really excited about. And while it is awesome and makes us feel like we could be living in a cool sci-fi movie, um, it is going to be much easier to live on Earth and take care of our own planet than try to turn Mars into a livable place. So take care, take care of our own planet would be my, my takeaway. All right, thank you, Emily. But on behalf of everyone who is making Guess Who possible, I would like to thank Ohio State Energy Partners for partially funding tonight's event and the contributions from numerous Ohio State departments that make up this STEM Impact Collaborative. Without all of that, we would not be able to be here tonight. But thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to thank specifically Shelly and Deanna for providing closed captioning services for this event. And thank you to Johnny and Catherine for serving as our most excellent guessers this evening. I also wanna thank Emily, Emily, and Nick for serving as our contestants and rolling with the um, sort of like gray descriptions of what we've described for each of our events. Also behind the scenes, we have Courtney Price, Catherine O'Brien, Cynthia Can Cannon, Monica Delgado, and Jason Servanick. I am Wayne Schlingman, and we hope that you can join us for another STEM Impact Collaborative future event. So thank you all for coming and have a wonderful night. Mm -hmm.